This episode is brought to you by Rune. Rune 1.8 is an immersive new music experience featuring a new look, new intelligence, and new features designed for music fanatics. Click the link in the description box below for more information. Recently, we made a video about a thousand euro hi fi system, which I went out and bought, and I bought all of it without hearing it. Now, I wouldn't recommend that you do that and I explain why in that video. But buying your first hi fi system or even your second hi fi system can be very complicated. And for newcomers, if that's you, I know it can be daunting. But before you get to the gear, I think you need to ask yourself some questions about yourself and your life and your living environment and your tastes and your preferences because this will help narrow a very wide range of possibilities down to a smaller field. This set of 10 questions I'm about to give you will hopefully help you develop a short list of gear that you might want to go out and listen to at your dealer or at your local hi-fi society or even at a friend's house or even buy on a home demo arrangement. The first question you should ask yourself, this is a big one actually, very, very important. How big is your room? How, how large would you classify your room as being? Would you call it small? Would you call it medium? Would you call it large? I don't have any specific measurements to say anything less than this number of square meters is small, but my room here is six meters by five meters, so 30 square meters. I would classify this as the lower end of medium. Now this is important because it will determine what kind of speaker you can accommodate in your room acoustically. So for example, I would not put a hulking, great, enormous, two meter tall, floor standing loudspeaker in this room. Equally, if I got a really small mini monitor, it might sound a little bit lost in this room as well. But if you've got a small room, a tiny mini monitor might work. And if you've got a large room, then maybe that big, hulking, two meter speaker might be good for you. Second question, to what degree do you see a hi-fi system as a household appliance? like a washing machine, like a coffee maker, like a laptop, like a smartphone. Because this might help you determine whether or not you kind of go for an active loudspeaker system where all the amplifiers and the DACs are built into the speaker cabinet. There's an example behind me, the LS60 from Kef. They have the speakers and the amps and the streamer built in. You don't need anything outboard or anything extra. So if you do see a hi-fi system as a bit like a, an appliance that you just might use, like a TV, then you can probably eliminate very quickly a lot of the passive loudspeakers that don't have the amps built in and therefore the outboard amplifiers, and you can just concentrate on active speakers and powered speakers. Supplementary 2B question here is, do you know the difference between powered speakers and actives? Number three. Are you a loud listener or do you prefer to listen to music at lower volume levels? You've got to ask this of yourself because if you're a loud listener, then you want a loudspeaker with the electronics as well that allows you to play loud without the speaker starting to distort. Equally, if you're somebody who really savors music at lower volume levels, a bit like me really, then you want a speaker that doesn't kind of white out as you turn the volume down. Because a lot of stand mounts do this, not all of them, but a lot of them do. And generally I find that high sensitivity speakers like Zoo, like Klipsch, like JBL, tend to come on song, like they come into bloom with sound, much lower on the volume dial. So not only do you really need to ask yourself like what kind of listening are you in terms of volume, but then go and find speakers that also play to those needs. Number four, do you prefer the look of a floor stander or do you prefer the look of a stand mount? Now stand mounts come in all shapes and sizes, yes, so do floor standers. But some people and some household members really don't like floor standers. They tend to think that there's just so much speaker it overwhelms the room. Even though the, the footprint on the floor 
might be the same as a stand mount on a stand. Just somehow, some people tend to prefer stand mounts on stands. I am one of those people in the main. I would say 70% of my sort of inclination is towards stand mounts and stands rather than floor standers, but not always. But I'm asking this question, or I'm asking you to ask yourself this question, because aesthetics matter. Like how something looks really matters. And especially the loudspeakers, because when you're sat in front of them listening to music, you're going to have a look at them. And the, you're probably not going to move them too often because they're kind of heavy or awkward to move. So yeah, you need to have a speaker that you like the look of because you're going to be looking at it all the time. Also, maybe when you're watching TV. Also, maybe when music is not playing. Question number five is, would your downstairs neighbors object to you running a subwoofer? Now you might be thinking, well, I don't have any downstairs neighbors. Well, lucky you, therefore you don't even have to really worry about this too much. Although you might have to worry about if you've got a, like a, a neighbor on the side, if you live in a semi-detached house or an apartment where somebody's living next to you, you might worry about the base bleed that goes through the wall. Oh, just knock my plant there. I don't have any neighbors per se below me. I mean, I'm on the sixth floor of an apartment block but below me is five floors of offices, which is one of the reasons I chose to live here, is so that any base bleed in the evenings disturbs nobody. So if you're gonna get a sub, you need to think about your neighbors, not just the people above and behind you or off the side, but the people below you. Question number six, do you know what an open baffle loudspeaker is? And also, do you know why you might want one? Let me tell you why you might want one. Basically, an open baffle is a loudspeaker without the box in the back. So it's just the front baffle with drivers mounted in and you can see the drivers from behind. Now, one of the key advantages of these is that they have what's called a figure eight dispersion pattern. So when you look at the dispersion pattern from above, the sound sort of comes out the front like that and then out the back like that, but sort of cancels more on the sides. So if you have a narrow room, almost like a corridor type room, you might want an open baffle loudspeaker because it's not gonna throw a lot of sound sideways and therefore you're not gonna get as many reflections off the walls on the sides that then arrive late at the listening position to your ear and sort of mess with the sound a little bit because this is why your, basically your room messes with your sound is because of reflections from not just the walls but the ceiling and the floor. So an open baffle loudspeaker can help mitigate that problem in narrow rooms sometimes. Number seven, to what degree are you a minimalist? I'm very much a minimalist at heart even though my room is full of hi-fi gear. It does bug me a little bit actually, it kind of makes me feel a bit twitchy sometimes. But I would much prefer, if I wasn't doing this thing as a job, I would have a pair of speakers and a streaming amplifier. So basically three boxes. Or I would have some streaming loudspeakers. So as, as few boxes as possible. No hi-fi rack, nothing like that. So if you are a minimalist, you, you can maybe look towards streaming loudspeakers or streaming amplifiers with a pair of passive loudspeakers attached. And that will help you narrow your focus a little bit more than just kind of browsing the internet effectively blind. Question number eight is kind of related to that in that you should ask yourself, do you like to tinker with technology? Because if you're kind of a tinker who likes to play with this and mess around with settings and different cables and different components, then you do not want a minimalist setup. You don't want just a single streaming amplifier because that contains the streamer, the DAC and the amp. You don't want streaming loudspeakers because they contain the streamer, the DAC, the amp, and the speaker drivers. You want to separate this all out into loudspeakers, separate outboard amplifier, separate outboard DAC, separate outboard streamer, or a combination thereof, so that you can swap these components in and out. Because if you're a tinkerer, you might get a lot of pleasure from doing that. Number nine, ask yourself, is your couch movable? Hi-fi people like to talk a lot about how you should move your speakers around and test how that sounds in the listening position. But that moving them around also applies to the listening position itself. So can you move your couch backwards? Can you move it forwards? Because you might need to do that 
with certain speakers and yeah, certain room configurations. So if you have a loudspeaker that is very much, it can only go in one position because living arrangements dictate that, then you might need to have more flexibility with your listening position. Number 10, bit of a spicy one this one. Would anybody in your household object to you hanging acoustic panels on the walls? A bit like how I have them here. I don't have anybody here to object, so I'm good. But you might live with a family and you might have people who'll be like, no way are you putting all that kind of ugly stuff on the walls. Fair enough. So that will also determine what kind of gear that you buy because if you can't correct the room's acoustic anomalies with passive treatments like this, you might want to consider streaming amplifiers that have room correction software built in. They, they do kind of slightly different jobs to each other. Like these kinds of treatments tend to tackle sort of high frequencies and mid-range frequencies. Room correction software can do that, but I think it's most effective with the bass, which is where you're gonna have the biggest problems. I still have bass problems in this room, and I still love room correction software. So for me, when I'm looking for like new gear, room correction software in that gear is of keen interest to me, and might be to you if you have a problematic room. And let me tell you, everybody has a problematic room, everybody because it's built into the dimensions. It's mathematically encoded into the room. So this is probably also another really good question to ask yourself about like, can you put up room treatments or would you want to tackle it in software? And this kind of goes all the way back to question one about how big is your room? So yeah, there we are. 10 questions to ask yourself before undergoing the search for gear to buy as your first or second hi-fi system. I'm not gonna assume here that just because it's your first hi-fi system that you're gonna be looking to save every penny because not everyone's like that. Some people might just go straight out and buy a very expensive pair of streaming active loudspeakers or a very expensive separate system. It's got nothing to do with money. It's really, this video has nothing to do with gear. It's just, you need to know you and your living arrangements and who you are and what your proclivities are and how you see hi-fi. It's very, very important before you spend any money. In fact, before you go and look at any gear. Anyway, if you like this video, please consider hitting the like button down below. If you like my attitude to high-end audio in that it's not always gear focused and that behavioral psychology really does come into play more than many audiophiles ever like to admit or talk about. So if you dig that, please consider subscribing to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.